made a New Year's resolution. A few of you did, I see. I guess most of them are already broken, right? I, I read something the other day that said uh, resolutions were like crying babies in church. They didn't do any good unless they were carried out. <laughs> the, uh, uh, you know, you read material when you're getting ready to uh, speak. And uh, I read another one I thought was really good. Said this guy made a New Year's resolution to lose weight. And uh, one morning he was on the scales. And you know how men are. They'll, they'll get up there and they'll, you know, throw out that chest. Of course, most of us have the furniture disease. My chest fell down in my drawers. <laughs> But uh, this guy and his wife saw him up there, you know, like that. And, and she said, that is not going to help you lose any weight. And he said, I know that, but that's the only way I can see the scales. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to see you again. I'm really happy to be here. I saw Brother Dan last night, and uh, he's enjoying the conference that we were at. Uh, and his favorite pastor is preaching today, uh, Jerry Vines, and he wanted to um, he wanted to hear him. So he asked me if I would kind of come up here and fill in for him, and I said yes. I had a great time up there, and I really did. And I'm glad to see all of you this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much that uh, I have this opportunity to worship with these fine folks today. Lord, I just uh, yield myself completely to your Holy Spirit this morning and ask him to do his work in my life and to do his work in the people who are here today to hear your word. Lord, I, I know that um, there's nothing that I could say as a man that would make any difference in their lives. But Lord, you can speak through me with your Holy Spirit, and I pray that everything that I say and think today, Lord, and the words that I speak will be those that you would have me speak. And I pray, Lord, that um, your your Holy Spirit would take control right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know about you, but uh, I like a new start occasionally. Don't you? Don't you like to come to a point where, okay, I'm going to have a new start. This is going to be a new year, and I'm going to have a great year. Well, 2018 might not have been a great year. It certainly wasn't for me, and I'll explain to you why. Uh, one morning I woke up, and I had a pain in my left leg, and it was, it was I kind of couldn't get it away, you know. I, it was annoying me, and um, it got worse. It just kept getting worse, and... I was having trouble walking. So I went to my doctor, and, you know, he yanked and pulled and stretched on that leg, and he said, I can't find anything wrong with it. But while he was examining my leg, he, he noticed a little spot on my leg, and it turned out that that was shingles. Now, I've had the shingles before, but this time... I didn't have a rash, I didn't have any itching, I didn't have anything, but there was that one little spot on my leg. And he looked at that and he said, I know what your problem is. Oh, and by the way, he kind of frowned and said, oh, I know what your problem is now. And I said, what is that? He just said, shingles. I said, why in the world can a little spot like that cause so much trouble? He said, well, they're working on the inside. And they were killing the nerves in my left leg. 
I went to the neurologist and um, I told him what was going on. So he he took all kind of tests, and wired me up and ran electricity up and down my muscles and so forth. And when he got through, I asked him, I said, am I going to be able to walk all right? He said, I don't think so. And that consumed me for a year because that's how long it took for it to get to the point where I could walk up here without any assistance. God worked in my life, but it took a long time for me to come to my senses and realize that God can fix anything. Amen? Nick, give me another. Amen? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yes. And, and so when we look at 2019, how do we look at it? How are we going to look at 2019? I'm going to look at it as a great year, and I hope you are. But you know there are a lot of people in this world that their perspective of the world is a perspective of fear and dread and what's next mentality. You know, the problem is they look at Fox too much. And then there are those that we have to pray for that watch CNN. Amen? Amen? <laughs> but, but, you know, we don't have a lot to really look forward to if we look at what we think the world's going to give us, right? Well, of course, there's always the good news and the bad news. The bad news is that many Christians and most people, they're looking at things that we have invested in in the past, things that we have put our trust, our hope, and our confidence is in, but that's evaporating. You can't put your confidence in the stock market. It's, it's like a saw blade, right? Going up and down and up and down and up and down. You can't put any confidence in our politicians. They can't even get together and, and agree on anything. Have you ever? I've never seen it this bad. I'm an old man. And I've been watching politics for a long time. I've never seen anything like this. Where they can't even sit down and talk. Well, you know... Those rich politicians already have their wall. You know, they have a wall around where they live, but they don't want to have a wall around our country that will protect us from, you know, things that we don't need to be having to put up with. The reality is that the source of supply in our life is Jesus Christ. The good news is that Jesus will supply all of our needs. We must realize that our Christian life does not depend on worldly supply. Our Christian life depends upon a spiritual a supply. God will provide for us in 2019 just like he has in 2018, 17, 16, 15, 14. I didn't realize I could count backwards. <laughs> but we have to realize that we're going to have to depend on Jesus Christ if we're going to have the life that he wants to give us. And what is that life? It's an abundant life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and to destroy, but I have come that they may have life and they may have it to the full, or that word can also be abundant. Um, let me give you an illustration, a little story here, and you all know this story. It's in Genesis and when the Hebrews had been uh, uh, allowed to leave Egypt and they crossed over the Red Sea, 
God would have to supply for them quite a bit, wouldn't he? But the people began to grumble with Aaron and Moses. And they had a reason to grumble. Let me, let me explain. Do you know how many people left Egypt to try to go to the promised land? Two million plus. Now I want you to think about that for just a moment. Two million plus people left Egypt and headed for the promised land. And when they left, they didn't have time to pack a lunch. God said, get everything, get your clothes, and get out now. So they crossed over the Red Sea with basically the clothes on their back. And they begin to grumble and, and talk to Aaron and Moses and say, look, here we are over here. We don't have any food. We've come out here, and you're going to let us starve to death. And they said, I'd rather go back to Egypt and die there because they have plenty to eat. But isn't it amazing how people think about eating when they've got other problems they need to be dealing with. Amen? <clears throat> well, what God said in Exodus 16, 4, He said, look, I will rain down bread from heaven for you, and the people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. Now, when they went out there and looked at that, they had no idea what it was. There was this uh, round, white, bread-like product all over the ground, so they just looked at it and said, manna. Manna means, what is it? They didn't know what it was. It's, it's what is it? Well, they had no idea that God was also providing for them physically, but he was giving them a symbol of what was to come that would provide for them spiritually. Let me explain. You say, now, what in the world does manna have to do with Jesus? Well, the manna is a perfect, symbol of our Lord Jesus Christ. The manna came at night, just like Jesus came. In Luke 2, 8, the Bible says that the shepherds were out watching their flocks, and Jesus Christ was born. Luke 2, 11, the Bible says, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Christ came at night as a provision for us spiritually. The manna came at night as a provision for the Hebrews physically. The manna was round, a circle, which never has a beginning or an end. John 1, 1 through 2, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, he was with God in the beginning. God has, Jesus has always been. You know, Jesus wasn't born on Christmas Day. That was when God decided to take the form of a man and come down and bear our sins. So we see that that round little bread was a symbol of Jesus. The manna was white. It was pure white. And that's a symbol of Jesus' sinless life. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says that God made him who had no sin to be sin for we, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was pure. 
Jesus was sinless. He was the only man that could bear our sins because he had never sinned. Jesus Christ was pure. The manna was sent to give life. The manna was sent so that the Hebrews would have something to eat. Jesus was sent so that we might have life. Jesus said, I am the bread of heaven. In John chapter 6, verse 32, 33, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus Christ, like the manna, is the bread of life. He also said in John 6, 34 through 35, Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Isn't there a song entitled, uh, The Bread of Heaven? Yeah, The Bread of Heaven. So, so Jesus is comparing himself to the manna. He said, my father sent the manna in, in the desert for the, for the uh, Hebrews, but he has sent me so that you might have the bread of life. And that bread of life is Jesus. What do we do when we take communion? We have a little piece of bread, right? And we take that bread. He gave his life on the cross for you and me. What a Savior. Amen? Come on. What a Savior. Amen. I mean, are you happy you're saved? <laughs> are you happy you're saved? Amen. All right. Well, thank you. That's much better. Come on. Get with it. The, the manna was very sweet, and the, that represents the sweetness of Jesus. There's no man that has ever walked on this earth that was sweeter than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. You see, when we accept Christ, we taste that sweetness. We taste that bread of life. We taste that manna from heaven. We know what it is. It's Jesus. The manna fell fresh every day. And the Bible tells us that the blessings of God fall fresh every day. You know, God didn't God told them don't don't you get any of that and store it up because if you do it'll it'll rot. He said, I want you to pick it up fresh every day. And every morning when we get up in this life, we need to realize that God has just given us another blessing fresh every day. Well, just like the manna, God will provide for us through Jesus Christ the true manna from heaven. Philippians 4.19, the Bible says, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Tell me what you have in your life, what need you have in your life that Jesus Christ can't supply. There's nothing. There's absolutely nothing that the world can supply that can be greater than what Jesus can supply. So in 2019, I want all of us to look forward, look to Jesus. Don't worry about the problems that you have in life. I already let a problem take away a year basically of my life and create a real uh, situation of, of hard work for my wife. Don't let that happen. I'm certainly not going to do that. 
I'm going to look to 2019 believing that Christ is going to provide whatever I need. Amen? So just like the, the God's children in the wilderness, God sent Jesus to give us life. And God wants his children to live the abundant life. Well, now, before we talk about the abundant life, let's talk a little bit about what it is not. Some people and some pastors preach and believe that monetary wealth and prestige and power on this earth is the abundant life. But that's basically, and in and, and, and all ways, from an earthly perception. These things that we, we, we depend on in this life that are from the earth, they get us away from our relationship with God. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says, Do not love the world or anything in the world, if anyone loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of the eyes, the boasting of, the, uh, of the, what he can do and has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and the desires of the world pass away, but the man who has a the, who does the will of God lives forever. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, I know all about that. I got saved when I was 39 years old. And before I got saved, I only wanted to be a successful, powerful Wealthy man. I worked in a large corporation and I climbed the ladder of success just as fast as I could. But at the detriment of my relationship with my wife and with my family. You see, my heart desired the wrong thing. It did not desire what God would have me desire, and that would be or, or take care of my family and take their interest at, at heart and do, do what's right for them. The company would come to me and say, hey, I want you to move to Dallas, Texas. And I, so I'd go home and tell my wife, get ready, we're moving to Dallas. I wouldn't sit down and talk with her and say, honey, how does this, how do you feel about this? I didn't take the kids and sit down with them and say, hey kids, um, what do you think about moving to Dallas? I didn't do that. I just came home and said, we're moving. Well, you see, my heart was in the wrong place. And that can happen to any of us. Our heart can always be somewhere else other than where God would desire it to be. Well, I got saved. And things were going along pretty good, and I fell into that trap again. But thank God for my wife and for her love for me, and God brought me out of that. Now, we've been married 65 years. Now, kids, I want you to think about this. Don't go to sleep on me over there now, all right? I want you to think about when you find that guy that just makes you go like this, you know, and you want to get married, you better think about what kind of person you're marrying. If you're a lady, a little girl, you're going to grow up to be a woman, if you get ready to date somebody, check out how he relates to his mother and how does he relate to his sister. How does he treat them? Does he respect them? Well, if he doesn't, you need to move on and find somebody else. Amen? Amen. Okay, very good. 
Yeah. I have learned that he provides us enough so that we can enjoy a great relationship with him. Now that we see what Jesus is not talking about in John 10.10, 10, let's see what he is talking about. Jesus is talking about a life that is heavenly or spiritually abundant. When we rely on Jesus, we do not need to worry about our material needs. You know, right after I got saved, I got fired from a great job. Man, I just thought I had it made. And had it made, you know, God was just blessing me because I got saved. And we had a Bible study going at work. People were being saved. They were coming to our church and being baptized. And one day the boss called me in and he said, Hal, we don't need you anymore. Man. That broke my heart. I went home. I, well, actually, they, I had a company car, and they said, park your car over there, and I guess they expected me to walk home. <laughs> but, my, but Shirley came after me, and, and we went home, and we sat down at the kitchen table, and we started crying, and uh, I, I, just, I just didn't know what to do. But the difference <clears throat> in my life then was I had Jesus in my life. And you know how long I was without a job? One week. One week I had a job. And it turned out to be a much better job than the one I had because Jesus supplied that need. And I want you to know whatever you need, you might need healing, you might need, you know, a relationship healed. Uh, There's no problem that Jesus can't solve. And there's no need that he can't supply. Look at what we're in Matthew 6, chapter 25, uh, I'm sorry, verses 25 through 32. Therefore I tell you, Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food? And the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? But by worrying, you can take away hours of your life. Amen? Amen. (laughs) Thank you. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them, and he will provide them for you. You know, in today's world, we are enticed to want more and better than what we have even though what we have might be exactly what God wants us to have. In in God's Word, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6 through 11, I want to read you what God says about needs. But God knew this with contentment, is great gain. What did Paul say? He said, I don't care where, what state I'm in. Doesn't matter. That's where God wants me to be. 
But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. I'm sure you've heard that you've never seen an armored car following a hurt. You can't take it with you. God wants you to have it, enjoy it here. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now listen. But you, O man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What does God say? He says, be content with what you have. Seek his righteousness. That's what he really wants us to do. If we focus on our relationship with Jesus, he promises to meet all of our needs. When we have a truly heavenly perspective, we will see a definition of abundant life that goes well beyond material things. Now, we're talking about that kind of provision. The abundant life is also eternal life. In, in John 17, 1 through 3, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those who have, you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. In John 5, 24, Jesus said this, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life will not be condemned, and has crossed over from death to life. Let's think about this year as a great year that we depend upon the Lord for what we need rather than depending on ourselves and rather than depending on the world. Billy Graham wrote this unspoiled and unsoiled, the new year lies before us. We stand at the dividing of two streams, one called yesterday and the other called tomorrow. We know every bend and every turn in the river of yesterday, but the river of tomorrow stretches out into an unknown future. Don't let what happened in 2018 hold you back in 2019. Don't look back and say, oh my, it looks like it's going to be another year just like last year. If you had something that you had to face. But look at 2019 is a year where God's going to bless. Don't look back. I have a story I want to tell you about what happens when you look back. I played football with a, a young man who was a pretty good football player. But we had a rotten team. 
I mean, we just didn't know what we were doing and made all kind of mistakes and people beat us up so bad we was ashamed to go home. And one night we were playing the state champions and they were just beating us to a pulp. But old Floyd broke through the line and he got out there and he just got away from everybody. But he looked back when he got about 10 yards from the goal line to see if anybody was behind him. And guess what? He tripped over a little root or a little piece of ground or something, some little something that caused him to not score. Don't look back. Don't, look, don't let the things of 2018 affect you in 2019. Let's all go forward looking for a great year. Now, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you cannot experience the abundant life. So the, today, I want to offer you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ if you have not already done that as your Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. There's no other way to Jesus. There's no other road to heaven. The only road is the road that God has prepared and the only way to get on that road is to accept Christ as your Savior. Now, I know that many of you here are Christians. You've been saved. But maybe you're, you're really anxious about next year. This year, I mean, excuse me. And if you would like for me to pray for you, I would. If you're dealing with some difficulty in your life, if there's something that you're looking forward to that bothers you, I'll be happy to pray for you. So with our eyes closed and our head bowed, I want to invite you to come to receive Christ or come to receive his blessing for 2019. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to represent you here today. And Lord, I, I just pray that if there's anyone here that is bearing a heavy load this morning, a burden that they just aren't looking forward to in the coming year and this year, Lord, I pray that you would help them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would comfort them. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that's never accepted Christ, or if they're not sure whether or not they've accepted Jesus, I pray that they would come forward and let us settle it this morning. In 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says that he who has the Son has life. But he that does not have the Son does not have life. These things that I have written to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this life is in his Son. That's a testimony that God left of his Son. If you're not sure, come on up and let's talk. If you want prayer, come on up and let's talk.